Okay, so what we wind up with is red oak flower is red and white oak flower. And then this, I did this sort of as a little experiment just because I had heard that it's possible. So I had this little tabletop patiba oil press and pressed fat, out, pressed oil out of red oak acorns. This was my little test batch that I did. Um, and so it is viable. I've met people that have pressed 1500 pounds of red oak acorns down into oil. My takeaway from their experience is that the yield of oil they wound up with is hard to justify when you look back at all the different steps and the industrial scale machinery required to pull it off. Um, so they wind up having to charge quite a lot of money for the oil that they wind up with. It's really high quality oil, tastes really good. Potentially it's viable on a sort of small industrial scale. Um, but again, just my sort of personal bent, I have no interest in industrial scale anything. So um, my, you know, sort of the, the issue that I see in doing this is that you're taking a very well balanced food that has a complete protein, a decent amount of carbohydrate, and a really high quality fat, and you're refining it. Why would you do that? If you're gonna eat this oil, you're gonna have to put it back with some kind of protein and some kind of carbohydrate to actually make it palatable. So that doesn't make sense to me. I have a question, I may have missed it. After you are through with the leaching process and so forth, uh, at what temperature do you dry? Right, to get it back to the flour. So we, um, I dehydrate it. I have one of these like tabletop Excalibur dehydrators. You can dehydrate in an oven at like 170 is usually the lowest they'll go to. But again, you're kind of walking that line of cooking the starches. So in that Excalibur thing I've got, I set it at about 100 degrees. Um, Cause that's low enough. That's, you know, the, the temperature that people use for like raw foods is 115 or 114 or something like that. Cause that's the temperature where you start breaking down enzymes and weird stuff. So a little bit below that and you're, you still keep all your vitamins and everything totally intact. That's turning the, what you just got out of a wet situation into a dry enough thing to make into flour, is that what you're Yes, yeah, so you're dehydrating it. So what I do, I pull it out of the dehydrator, I then put it back into the Vitamix, but with a, they make a, a dry blade, basically. So it's a canister for the Vitamix that's got a blade in it specifically for dry ingredients. You could do that in a food processor as well. That's what we did for four or five years. Yeah. How long does that dehydration process take? It depends on how much you try to pack into your dehydrator. It's usually 12 to 24 hours, something like that. I usually put way too much in and so it takes like two days. Yeah. I guess another thing to note, sort of on, you know, human appropriate scale is that all of the drying stages, both for drying back down to make flour and for drying the nuts initially, uh, a car in the sun with the windows cracked is a dehydrator. So that works for all those steps. Any other questions about that? Before we talk about food, yeah. Just quickly, do you know anything about live oak acorns? Um, they're a different genus. Yeah, and so I don't really. I've met people that have processed a lot of them. There's this wild food author, Sam Thayer, who's written, he wrote, wrote this book, Nature's Garden, that's got 50 pages on acorns. If you're excited about this stuff, definitely a good book to pick up. He, what he said is that if he lived somewhere with live oaks, he would exclusively gather them. And this guy has gathered acorns all over the continent, so. I've never eaten them, I don't know, but. I live in Florida, so I'll have to try it. Yeah, they're, they're definitely edible. All these steps would work the same. I'm not sure what their fat content is. I've heard 
people say that they're that at least some of them can be like really oily. So yeah, not totally sure. Yeah. Um, would you recommend, okay, what well you're saying the collar is a good dehydrator. Um, would you recommend against using that for the drying process in the beginning because there's not airflow or what do you Well, you if you crack the windows, that should be sufficient. It can be decent enough. Yeah, you do. You would definitely want to monitor it and not just leave them in there for the issue could be that, you know, if you're having to dry for three weeks, you also need to use your car. <laughs> so <laughs> potentially. <laughs> So what I've seen people do though is use like old window screens and just set it in the dashboard and then pull it out and put it, you know, somewhere else and then whenever your car is parked, just have them out like that. So does that more or less make sense? Again, what I would say, if at any point you get stuck on one of these stages, more than free to email me, contact me, and I'll help you as best I can get through there. Uh, yeah, okay. So I guess we will, so, so what do you do with that flour? So this recipe that's on here, this is sort of our base recipe. This is, you know, this is for pancakes or waffles. Really this recipe can kind of be adapted to get a certain, you know, if you reduce or increase the liquid to get the consistency you're looking for, this can kind of be adapted to anything. The other thing, the sort of general guidelines is that any, like the way Amber's come up with most recipes is looking up paleo or gluten-free recipes that use almond flour and substitute acorn. Pretty much all of them have worked as a just one-to-one -one substitution. So those are uh, white oak pancakes with blackberries and roasted hazels on top. Uh, this is, I think this was actually white and red oak flour together waffles, and that's Kusa dogwood on top. The thing that Amber sort of really got down and that we've sold for a few years is acorn cookies. Um, and so, so that's, you know, Amber is a skilled baker, so there definitely is, you know, acorns are not wheat. They definitely require a sort of different approach to things, but it is totally possible to make baked goods with only acorn as the dry ingredient that will hold together. Um, that's another one of the things that I've commonly heard totally false information spread about. That I've seen published books that at the end will say, we've been so happy that we can substitute 50% of our wheat intake with acorn, and that's awesome, that's super cool, but you can definitely push it further than that. I guess the other thing, so I am not a baker at all. The main thing that I do with acorn flour is I mix it about a two parts ground pork and one part acorn flour. Whatever kind of greens I have handy, I chop up, mix it all up and fry it in lard. And that's probably my favorite food. Um, so yeah, it doesn't have to be fancy. So another example I like to give is one night, uh, Amber was coming home late, I had to feed our two older boys, and I just took some applesauce we had made and some acorn flour and mixed it up with some maple syrup and fried that in lard and they were like asking for it the next day. So <laughs> it's totally good food. You can kind of just mix it into anything and make it work. Getting fancier with it definitely requires some skill, but you know, I'm not fancy, so. Um, okay, and then this is, like I was saying, feel totally free to contact me about any of this stuff. I'm more than happy to help troubleshoot things or whatever. I'm also happy to, well, I guess we'll talk a bunch more about hazelnuts, but yeah, this is sort of our contact for all that stuff. So I guess now we will transition into, let's, let's take a little break and then, and I will go fetch the baker and we will set up the pizzas and then we will sort of uh, figure out the transport and go look at the hazels.